Well, hello, everyone. According to my clock, it is 12 noon Eastern time, so we're going to go ahead and get started with today's webinar. Uh, my name is Robin Bauer Kilgo. I'm Special Projects Manager for the Florida Association of Museum, and I'll be the moderator and also the tech person online today. So just a couple quick tech notes. Um, all attendees are muted, so if for some reason uh, your microphone is not muted, please do so just to kind of relieve background noise while we're doing the webinar. Uh, you will be allowed to ask questions through the chat box or the question box located at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to go ahead and enter in questions whenever you like. I'll be keeping an eye on them throughout the actual session, and then we'll report back with them at the end of it with our presenters. And this session is being recorded because um, we will be posting it, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second to our uh, FAM YouTube channel for everyone to view afterwards. So um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our topic today, which is the Florida Connecting to Collections um, webinar, which is based on insurance slash kind of risk management topics. Uh, but before I begin, I'm going to see if our executive director, Melinda Horton, can jump on the line to say a quick hello to everyone. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for, for participating today. Um, I want to make sure that I thank John Blades and Jeff Manette both for being on the call with us and being our experts on insurance and risk management. And of course, always thank you to Robin for doing a great job. So I hope you enjoy the webinar today and um, we look forward to getting your evaluations at the end. Thanks so much. Thank you, Melinda. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, to start off though, I'm gonna give you guys again the fact that we are gonna be recording this webinar. Um, we do have a FAM YouTube channel. I'll talk about that a little in a little bit, but if for some reason you know someone who might be interested in this topic or uh, maybe miss something, we will have this available probably by the end of the week at the latest to be able to get for everyone to view. Uh, this is our C2C project team. I'm, I'm up there. My name is Robin Bauer Kilgo. I am the Special Projects Manager for the Florida Association of Museums. You've just heard from our Executive Director, Melinda Horton. And our project associate on this project is Laura Nemmers. We have two great speakers today, um, both from the insurance profession. We have John Blades, who's Vice President and Division Director of Smart Solutions, a division of Bruce Gendelman Insurance Services, and Jeff Bennett, Senior Vice President of Huntington T-Block Insurance Agency. So thank you both for joining us today. For today's program, I'm going to be going into a brief intro overview of the Florida Connecting to Collections program. Uh, then John Blades will be presenting on insurance as preservation before an incident, kind of the types of coverage that are recommended. And Jeff will be covering insurance after recovery, how providers react after events occur. Now, if you're looking... Um, just as a heads up, well, and I'll backtrack a little bit. If you're looking for a slightly different take on this topic, we have a resource for you that I think everyone will be very excited to see at the end of this. But we felt like um, with this project or with this particular webinar, we would like some of the uh, specialists in the field to actually present on this topic. Now, getting back to our project, uh, Florida, Florida Connecting to Collections, this is a partnership. We are an IMLS-supported uh, program throughout the state of Florida. As you can see from the screen, um, it's a bunch of different folks. Uh, we have us over at FAM, we have the Society of Florida Archivists, Florida Public Archaeology Network, uh, FAZA, which is our zoos and aquariums groups, the Florida Library Association, and the Florida Art and Museum Directors Association. We all came together to actually make a program where we're trying to teach people across the state to develop collections policies and develop emergency plans. Now, we just finished out um, a couple months ago our Developing Emergency Plans program. This is actually a free resource that is available to anyone who is interested in developing emergency plans throughout the state. Um, we broke it up into eight modules. There are webinars, kind of like this one, available for anyone to view. There are activities, discussion questions, samples, and online resources, all located at that, at that web link down below. You can also just go to the, our website, which is just flamuseums.org, go to Professional Development, click on Florida Connecting to Collections, and we're there as well. Now, that program itself actually had uh, 77 participants across the state. We had uh, mentors and mentees, and we were able to help um, quite a few institutions across the state actually develop their emergency plans, so we're pretty proud of that fact. Again, a little bit of overview of the program that we have here. We basically have a bunch of different modules. We break down uh, either emergency plan or right now we're in our collections policies program. We break it down into a bunch of different modules. We have two workshops. One workshop, which is held at a mentor organization, organization who acts as a mentor, that's content-based. And then we have a second workshop, which are actually coming up too soon where it's a site view and a practical activity. So we've tried to make it, make it kind of workshop one is content, workshop two is a practical to kind of help people along. 
Uh, we also use the mentor-mentee policy where we have a bunch of mentees throughout the state who are assigned a mentor who help them. There's homework. Uh, we also touch base with mentees between our workshops, and we all participate in our online community. This is a quick screenshot of our online community. It's a great place where people can ask questions. Uh, they don't want to talk about something that maybe they don't want to blast to the universe they're able to do because it's password protected. So if you're interested in joining us for any reason, just let me know, especially if you're uh, Florida based, we're more than welcome to kind of have people join the group. And again, the link for that's located uh, at the bottom of the screen. And also we have links on our main website. As I mentioned, we have a FAM Florida C2C webinar on the YouTubes, um, we, on the YouTubes as we always like to say. The YouTube um, page, you just need to search for Florida Association of Museums. We have all of our emergency plan webinars already posted and we have a few from this collections policies um, subject that we're actually covering right now. We did one of these webinars back in January on found and collections abandoned property. That one is up and available for folks to view. And for today's topic, if you are interested in hearing from uh, museum or archives professionals kind of talking about how they've dealt with risk management or insurance, we have a webinar for that. It was done back in 2013, although the information is still quite good. Um, so if you want to kind of do more of a deep dive on this subject, you're more than welcome to go to our YouTube channel and just click on that link and you should be good to go. We do have an upcoming schedule of workshops. Um, we are halfway through module two, as you'll see down there, kind of on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, this module was based upon loans, documentation, inventory, and audits. Uh, our second workshop is going to be held on April 7th. And the fun thing about this new uh, program that we've kind of developed this time is that we have developed these mid-modular webinars, which is kind of halfway through the program. We pick a subject that we think a lot of folks will be interested in. It's voted on by participants, and we do this nice little deep dive. This time it was insurance risk management. For module three, which will be starting on May 19th, um, the topics for that module are access, use, collections, care, intellectual property. The webinars are potentially digitization or integrated pest management. Again, that will be voted on by the participants. The workshop, too, will be held June 16th. Our final module will be held, uh, the first workshop is going to be held August 4th, 2017. It's going to be basically be putting your collections policy together. The mid-module mid webinars for that one will either be sustainability or code of ethics, again, dependent upon participants. And then we'll have an online writer's workshop because our goal with the, these programs, with the emergency plan program I talked with before, and with the collections policies program, is for people to actually have policies or plans at the end of the actual uh, series. So that is the goal unto itself. Um, but again, we're pretty excited today because we get to talk about this topic called insurance and risk management, which is always very interesting for everyone. So I'm going to go ahead and hand off now control to our first presenter, who is John Blades. Um, as I was saying, he will be presenting on the topic of insurance, kind of what can be expected from people as they um, actually look into their insert ins insurance plans or well, anything along that line. So if John, if you could go ahead and accept presenter privileges, we should be good to go. Good morning, everyone. I... Uh... I retired after more than 40 years, uh, just last year after more, more than 40 years in the museum profession. And for the first 20 years of my museum professional career, I uh, didn't worry about insurance because I worked at Hearst Castle, which is part of the state park system in California. And they basically self-insured. We didn't lend objects. We didn't borrow objects. So we didn't have to worry about insurance for the most part. It wasn't uh, any of our concern as a staff in uh, Hearst Castle. But I accepted in 1995 an appointment to the Fiber Museum in Palm Beach, and within my first week of arrival, I was visited by I was visited by two insurance agents who um, were there to inform me. One was for our liability, our general liability insurance, and the other was for our workers' comp insurance. They were there to inform me that they were going to cancel our insurance because our losses had been so great. I uh, begged them not to cancel us and uh, stick with us. We would get it straightened out. They did, and we did. And um, we paid a lot of attention to insurance and our practices from then on. I want to emphasize before I talk about the kinds of insurance that you should have to manage your risk that it's not just about working with insurance underwriters for policies to cover your uh, risk, but it's about policies, practices, and systems you use in your museum to minimize risk, first and foremost, 
And it's not just about preserving objects, but it's about preserving resources that are better dedicated to the mission of your organization rather than buying uh, just buying insurance and um, paying high premiums sometimes because the resources aren't managed properly. Um, so let's go on to the kinds of insurance. The types of insurance that typically museums carry, of course, are property. You want to insure uh, the objects you have in your collection, the building, and so on. And for those of you who work in historic properties, Often the biggest and sometimes the most important object in the collection is the building itself with its uh, various uh, elaborate surfaces like ceilings and sometimes uh, paneling and floors and all kinds of built-in materials can be part of the collection as well. So please don't discount the, the possibility that the building itself might be your largest object and, uh, and something you need to dedicate a lot of thought to when determining what the right kind of insurance is. Property always includes fire, usually includes wind, although, or windstorm insurance, although um, that is a bit of, uh, in Florida, that's a bit trickier because we're hurricane prone, so sometimes wind storm is excluded. Um, you got to be careful when choosing, when you're setting up your property insurance, especially with an historic structure. You want to be careful that you don't wind up with just functional replacement Property insurance, in other words, if you lose a ceiling, the insurance uh, carrier is obligated to replace a ceiling, and it's not a functional ceiling. But if you have an historic property, you may have an elaborate cast plaster ceiling or an historic wood ceiling, and a simple drop ceiling, which is a functional replacement, isn't going to be sufficient, um, isn't going to satisfy you as uh, the, the person charged with preserving that historic site. Uh, the right amount of insurance is a bit of a tricky issue as well. Um, you, know, uh, you, you could have a, um, a building like Flight Museum, for example, that's worth uh, well over $100 million, but if you lose the entire building in some catastrophe, would you really create a replica? Does anybody really want to see a replica of an historic structure? You know, authenticity is a, is a key element in historic preservation, and I don't think a replica would be satisfactory. So ensuring for a full replacement may not make sense in that situation. Maybe you want to try to guess at uh, what the worst catastrophe you might want to come back from that would still leave you with an authentic building would be and ensure at that level. And that also, of course, would save you some money. Um, one of the things that doesn't get paid a lot of attention to is our suppression system. Um, and ironically, most historic structures are damaged, and lots, most collections, I would say, as well, are damaged not by fire, but by water uh, in one form or another. Uh, so often, uh, our museums are equipped with wet pipe sprinkler systems, and probably going back to policies, practices, and systems versus underwriters' insurance. Um, a wet pipe Sprinkler system can easily be replaced with a dry pipe system that can be converted to what's called a double action, double pre action dry pipe system, which means that the pipes are kept dry with dried air, sometimes with nitrogen. And when the smoke detector and the sprinkler head detect that there's a fire, then the system can be quickly charged with a high, uh, high capacity pump and, uh, and then the fire suppressed. But in the meantime, you know, risk, you don't have the risk of uh, some uh, inattentive maintenance person knocking off the sprinkler head and dumping hundreds of gallons onto your archives or your objects or ruining the, the historic ceiling below the floor, the floor below um, because there is no water in the pipes. So that's one of the best forms of insurance I think uh, many museums have been undertaken to, to convert there wet pipe system to a dry pipe system and it's relatively inexpensive. Annual fire inspections and making sense with your local fire department is another one of those practices that uh, is, is uh, every bit as important as buying a, an insurance policy from an underwriter. Um, and security systems are extremely important as well. So paying attention to them, having good security practices is essential as well. 
You can buy a special kind of uh, property insurance called boiler and machinery uh, insurance that might be important to some organizations to help maintain that uh, elaborate climate control system that keeps the temperature and humidity in your museum right where it needs to be to preserve your collection. A couple of pictures of historic structures that are familiar in our state. General liability. Um, very important, of course, we have a lot of visitors to our museum uh, from all over the country and from all over the world, and there are occasionally going to be accidents. There are special events uh, in our museums, private events, after-hours events, and it's important that uh, we have insurance to cover any kind of personal injury, medical expenses, etc. You might want to occasionally purchase, or you might need to occasionally purchase uh, liquor liability, for example if alcohol is being served. It's important, the one thing important here to know, I think, is that in addition to having a liability coverage, you secure from every uh, group or organization or individual hosting an event at your museum a certificate of additional insured. It's a certificate from their insurance uh, underwriter giving your museum equal rights, equal access, equal uh, standing uh, in case a claim is made. Uh, that, is, that term, additional insured, has very specific meaning, and you want to make sure you don't just get a certificate of insurance, which is essentially worthless uh, as far as the museum's concerns are uh, involved. But you want the certificate of insurance to say that the museum is named as an additional insured, and that that language is extremely important. Workers' compensation insurance, uh, of course, is, ne is required by law. And um, you can mitigate those costs uh, and, and, and help ensure that your collections are uh, and your building is uh, better cared for as well and mitigate some of your risk there by um, having very clear hiring policies uh, for example, some museums uh, don't hire anybody with a felony record. Doing background checks, making it a drug-free workplace, making it a non-smoking work environment, those kinds of things can reduce your insurance premium for workers' compensation by 5% or more. With regard to your volunteers, uh, you may want to purchase, they may be covered under your general liability, but you may want to purchase special insurance to cover your volunteers as well. You certainly want to run background checks on all staff, whether they're volunteer or paid. And you might want to check with agencies on aging or senior services groups in your area. Occasionally, they, these groups will uh, try to encourage volunteerism throughout your community by recognizing volunteer service and sometimes by providing insurance coverage for your volunteers as they travel to and from their volunteer assignment. And uh, usually that just involves having your volunteers sign up to be part of their organization, which is usually not onerous at all. Uh, of course, uh, insurance to cover the collections of the art, the central, whether it's a painting or the archive, uh, archival materials. And again, right amount is uh, a bit tricky because I, we, it's not practical for us to to uh, appraise the entire collection each year and adjust the amount of insurance. Again, you can choose to insert the level you think will cover your worst loss. Of course, you want to make sure that you're covered for transit when you lend uh, your or your collection is stored off-site in another location. Automobile insurance is essential, of course. Uh, your museum probably, or many do anyway, have vehicles they use for their programming. And of course, your staff may run errands for the museum in their own vehicles. And you want to be careful to work with uh, your insurance agent to make sure the carrier, you have the right kind of insurance to your carrier. Um, some and some carriers uh, recently, your underwriters have uh, determined that if uh, your staff is dri are driving their own cars on museum business. They have to have a certain level of coverage through their personal auto insurance, and uh, that may require the museum to adjust its policies and, or in some cases, maybe supplement uh, 
make supplemental payments to the staff to bring everybody up to the right level, help them all come up to the right level for their personal auto insurance. Uh, you want to have directors and officers insurance, of course, or sometimes it's called management liability insurance, and that can be more, that can be a broader form of insurance, but um, definitely want to have some management liability coverage for your board of directors and for your employment practices. Um, that's pretty standard. And lastly, you want to have umbrella or excess insurance. And really what that's about is to extend your liability, if need be, to a broader amount of coverage or a greater amount of coverage and cover a, a number of things that may be uh, gaps in your general liability policy. Um, it covers you really in two ways. So you might be sued for land, slander, or liable. Uh, that probably wouldn't be covered under your general liability, uh, but it wouldn't be covered under excess uh, or umbrella insurance. And I might just mention, lastly, uh, some museums purchase key man insurance, which is a form of life insurance, because there may be staff who, uh, typically the director, who the trustees or the directors deem so important to the operation the loss of that person would um, create a financial, financial hardship that they uh, tend to cover with key man insurance. Thank you so much, John. That was a good overview of just the different types of insurance that um, different institutions can actually purchase. So I'm going to go ahead now and switch it over to our next presenter, Jeff. Jeff, if you could go ahead and accept presenter privileges, that would be wonderful. And as I said, Jeff will be kind of presenting on uh, how the insurance agencies or era kind of uh, reacts to after we have to use you guys. You always, we always like to meet you. But then when we right. have to use right. you, <laughs> that's always the difficult thing. Exactly. I want to thank you all for, for inviting me to participate today. Um, I want to give you a little bit of, back, a little bit of background of, of my experience. I had worked for the American Association of Museums for almost 10 years. Um, I sit on the board of the AAM Registrar's Committee at the moment and uh, looking forward to seeing everybody in St. Louis. Um, and also I was involved with uh, the... With, uh, the redo of the standard facility report, which is now known as the general facility report, which was launched, I think, a few, three or four years ago, um, and replacing the standard uh, facility report. Um, so today's, today's conversation is going to, to be around the, um, some influential events of late that have sort of shaped the modern, uh, insurance world in terms of, uh, fine arts and, uh, classes coverage. Uh, we've had some catastrophic events. Recently, the three that I'm going to touch on today um, are one is the Momark fire that happened back in 2004. Uh, obviously, 9/11, uh, which was another um, uh, shaping event in the insurance uh, insurance world, um, and then in, and then the hurricanes that we've had um, most recently, Hurricane Sandy, uh, which affected the Northeast Coast, and uh, another hurricanes Rita and Mike uh, that have sort of shaped. Um, coverages um, and affected um, how fine art and collections insurance um, is, is um, perceived and, and underwritten by, by companies. Um, and now you can hear me, hopefully. <laughs> um, so first, um, first thing I want to discuss is, is the Momar Park Warehouse fire. I'm not quite sure if everyone's familiar with this fire, but um, it, it happened in 2004 um, outside of uh, a town outside of London. Uh, Momark was one of the largest, and still is one of the largest art warehouse facilities uh, globally. They have a, a very huge, large presence still in the United Kingdom. Um, they experienced a devastating fire uh, back in 2004. 2004. Um, it wasn't known immediately what the cause of the fire was, but they did determine that it was from a neighboring um, a facility that, that had petroleum, um, and they think that there was a tossed match or something that Cause, cause this devastating fire. The warehouse facility itself um, did not have a sprinkler system. Um, it was sort of just um, used as a fine art storage facility without any kinds of uh, mitigation or pro uh, precautions uh, before this art was moved in. A lot of the artwork that was lost was, um, um, I guess, uh, uh, top British artists of, of the 21st century, um, 20th century British art. Um, Sachi's collection, um, 
a big, big component of, of, of uh, the, the collector Sashi was, was uh, destroyed. Artists such as uh, Patrick Heron, Gillian Ayers, Craigie, uh, Carrier Montaner, uh, Chapman, and then Tracy Eman, who, Eman, who had her entire, almost her entire uh, collection, um, everything that she had done, ever done. Uh, was destroyed in this fire, including the image of this tent here, uh, which is the last thing I said. Uh, the last thing I said to you is I don't leave, want to leave me was one, and then this tent was here, is everyone I've ever slept with, from 1963 to 1995. Um, these are um, incredible pieces of, of modern art. Um, Damien Hurst was also uh, housed a collection there. Um, so a lot of, a lot of things are were destroyed close to, I believe, sixty million dollars uh, in, in fire art loss. I believe this was probably one of the largest art losses um, uh, caused by fire um, in recent memory. Uh, and so, with the cause of uh, insurance company companies are, are pretty much reactionary. Um, and um, and right after this fire, they wanted to know more and more about where the artwork is located. If you have artwork um, or any part of your collection objects located outside of your museum, they want to know um, where the how where that uh, collection is, is located. So they want to collect a lot more information about those locations than they ever did before. Um, they want to know uh, what the approximate value is at each one of those locations. What are the other businesses that may be near or close by um, these facilities? They want to know if there's a fine art, bona fide fine art warehouse facility. They also want to know if, um, how the collection is stored, how the collection is protected. Um, one thing that was an issue with Nomart is a lot of people that were contracts or clients of Nomart had no idea that their collections were actually at this particular facility. Because what Nomart had done, apparently, they had shifted, um, some of, some of the, their clients the collections into this facility without the client's knowledge. So it's really important, I think, to, when you work with your warehouses, that one is a fine art warehouse. Two, it has, it's alarmed for, um, fire and, and burglary protections. It's a, a secured location, um, climate controlled if, if important to your collection. Um, um, and that they have an emergency or disaster plan in case something, um, they can move the collection to another facility. To protect it, I think what's also important um, of that, that you know where your collection is at all times. If your your contracted fine art warehouse decides to ship it to another location, um, you should be well aware. In addition, with transits, when your company is when you hire a company to do your transits, make sure. Oftentimes, transit companies also uh, subcontract. Um, um, those transits to other companies. You want to make sure that if that's the case, that they're a bona fide uh, transit company that um, has the experience in, in shipping and handling art. Um, insurance companies really want to know more and more information about the collection. And the more information that you provide to them, um, the better off it is in, in your rating and in print. So um, that being said, I'm going to move on to, I think, the next slide. Um, another, or another event happened, um, obviously with September 11th. Not only did we lose, um, a, thousands of lives, um, businesses were destroyed, but also art was missing and art was destroyed. Um, this is, um, I forgot the name of the artist as a, a German artist, but it was re, it was right between the two towers. Um, and this is how it is today. And it's, uh, it's in Battery Park. Uh, showing the damage. Um, inside the World Trade Centers, um, there works by Pablo Picasso were Lichtenstein with Cupizia, um, which creates the walls and the interior of tower. Um, there is one in the world that had a huge tapestry in, in the lobby of World Trade Center 2. Tanner Fitzgerald, which is, you know, they, they lost several lives. Um, they also had, uh, uh, several works by Rodin, including works on paper, including sculpture, that were part of um, of their collection. Right after 9/11, there was a Heritage National uh, a team was created of the Heritage Emergency National Task Force 
um, which was established. Um, so sort of like determine what the what the total art loss uh, losses were um, at 9/11. Um, that uh, network has since been dissolved, but they were able to estimate that it was staggering 100 million dollars in lost art, probably 10 million dollars with public art was was uh, was destroyed. Um, shortly after 9-11, what we saw um, in the insurance industry are, are twofold. One is the four policies um, covered the perils of terrorism, because we never had a terrorist act on the soil of the U.S. Um, so most policies, including foreign policy policies and collection policies, included um, um, damage or loss as a result of terrorism. They weren't that terrorism was not excluded. Right after 9-11, we saw a lot of companies midterm, meaning during the course of the policy term, actually exclude terrorism, um, which was unprecedented. Um, and then at renewals, many, many, uh, museums and, um, businesses lost terrorism coverage. As a result, um, terrorism was not available other than through the London market at a very high price, if, if it was important. And also in the U.S., uh, New businesses or new construction activities ceased uh, because the requirements by public entities and such developers required terrorism coverage. So basically, construction, any new construction sort of stopped. Um, Congress, um, through an act of Congress, it was decided that they really need to get an affordable program together um, for the purchase of terrorism coverage so construction industries can start um, developing new buildings and and we, can, and we can move forward uh, with our economy. Uh, so the, thus, the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act was born uh, through an act of Congress. That uh, uh, made terrorism coverage uh, available. Uh, projects can start anew. And also, it, it trickled down to fine art collection policies, uh, where terrorism then was offered by your brokers. Um, terrorism... Um, became a little more affordable over time, and today it's much more affordable than it was. Um, as a result of what happened in 9-11, there was a lot of um, information that these companies that, that were housed there um, about their collections or the data and the information was stored within the Royal Trade Center and those offices. Um, so underwriters that were insuring locations in the Royal Trade Center and elsewhere um, did not um, have any adequate data um, to turn to when there was a loss of the artwork. So as a requirement now, many um, insurance companies uh, ask for details um, of the inventories that are at these locations. So it's also important that if you have a database, that you keep that database on a separate server outside of your organization in case there's a catastrophic loss. Um, so it's recommended that you have a copy of uh, your data on a, on a CD, or you have it on an off-site storage, or if you don't have a collection management software system, um, then copies of the files themselves uh, to, should be kept elsewhere. So in case of a catastrophic loss, otherwise we'll be able to turn to that inventory list to um, realize what was being insured and what was lost. The next one, I'm going to present some images of um, of a hurricane. And th these are images that uh, were taken from Hurricane Night. And it really shows the devastation of, of what a storm can do. This storm actually came through Galveston. There's just a series of pictures of, of how and the power of a hurricane, a windstorm. And I'll just quickly run through these. Um, as you can see, it's, it's quite devastating. Um, And uh, it really destroyed the coastal, the coastal areas in Galveston. Similarly, uh, with Hurricane Sandy, um, the, the storm surges during Hurricane Sandy caused some similar um, destruction. Not nearly as bad as what happened with, with, with Ike. But I just wanted to show you these just to show you the clear devastation that, um, that a storm such as this can, can take. And it's really the surge of the water that really affects um, that takes out a lot of damage um, to property, to uh, and then destroying people's lives. Um, 
quickly run through these. And perhaps many of you um, in the Southeast maybe have already seen these images. Um, um, I just think that they're um, quite impressive in terms of how the storm could totally devastate this community. But at Hurricane Sandy, actually, there was more than $300 million in art loss to the galleries and collectors and fire storage facilities that were located along the East and Hudson Rivers. Um, you know, we knew that, I live in New York City, we knew that there was a hurricane approaching. Um, you know, galleries did the best they could in terms of mitigating um, for this encroaching storm. They did, you know, many of them um, did remove stuff from, the, from below grade. Some of them put them on higher shelves. Other galleries uh, put paintings and, and whatnot. Uh, put them on, they kept them on the walls. Maybe put them up higher on that wall. Um, because we just, you know, we in the industry, we just have thought that you know a storm surge, you know, maybe eighteen or twenty inches from the ground would be sufficient enough. So uh, a lot of galleries, you know, uh, just just did that thing, and that would that would be enough. They, um, but we were all surprised. Uh, that night, there was, uh, or early morning, it was a full moon. Uh, the tides were high. Um, the wind was incredible. Uh, the surges were up to 12 feet high. Um, the buildings, uh, the, any gallerist or collector that had uh, items stored in below grade, and they were close to the east, um, close to the Hudson River or to the East River, um, they're their, their basins were flooded, and then their gallery spaces on the first floor were covered in water and storm surge up to 12 feet. So paintings along, that were hung on the wall, they had watermarks that were uh, three quarters almost to the top of those paintings. So they were, they were pretty much destroyed or, or severely damaged by water. Um, I lived there and I, I went there uh, the following morning to talk to a lot of my clients to see what I can do to help. And it was just incredible. We had uh, no um, electricity. We had very limited cell service, if any. Um, galleries were walking around with their hands up in the air, <laughs> uh, wondering what to do. Uh, never experienced any uh, catastrophic kind of disaster such as that. And, and my time as doing insurance or ever, um, I went into some galleries where I discovered that not only were there water lines, but uh, one gallery had bronze sculptures that were on um, either on the floor or on, or on uh, secure pedestals. Some of these sculptures were that weighed hundreds and hundreds of pounds. They decided not to move the sculpture because they thought the sculptures were heavy enough to withstand any kind of um, rising water. Well, lo and behold, a lot of these sculptures were tossed through the storm surge and into other walls, into other walls of galleries. Uh, uh, into walls of their neighbors. Um, and just the strength of the power of these storms are incredible. Um, uh, a lot of the galleries that morning and into the next day, into the next few days, were um, trying to collect all the work that can be saved. Um, so there are a lot of open space um, where there are triages set up for a lot of the works on paper, a lot of the other works on canvases, um, uh, trying to protect and dry out um, thousands and thousands of works. Um, conservators were backlogged. You know, there's just a, a finite amount of fine art loss adjusters out there and, and conservators. Uh, they're just backlogged, which is the volume of, 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 of losses. Um, as I mentioned, there are $300 million in paid losses. Um, which is uh, which was an incredible amount. This, I think, was the largest uh, fine art loss in the history of the U.S. Um, through Hurricane Sandy and through the other hurricanes, I read up, um, insurance companies 
now are asking all institutions and collection management um, institutions and cultural cultural institutions and museums to develop their disaster plans, especially ones that are located in coastal areas or um, in California earthquake uh, prone areas. Um, we saw that um, insurance companies' response after the storm um, um, and at policy renewals of uh, many of the affected galleries and, and maybe some cultural institutions actually they were they were pretty good for the most part, uh, or collectors or even fine art warehouse facilities. That flood or light, rising water was excluded. Higher deductibles were applied. Um, there may have been some coverage re re restrictions, um, and um, such as they would not be covering insurance companies would not want to be covering anything that was stored below grade. Um, um, a whole city of New York, New York's whole uh, city of New York, especially Manhattan and Brooklyn, um, their flood zones were re. Um, Remapped, re um, so a good part of the city is now under a flood zone. The category is A, B, and C flood zone. Um, so they were, those areas were extended. If your institution or if your gallery is located in those areas, um, chances are the insurance companies will either decide not to insure or not to renew or to place these restrictions. Um, the one way that we get a, around that is. Uh, we can get around that is that we have to sell, um, we have to sell to the insurance company. I mean, I'm a broker, so we have to sell to the insurance company what the institution or, or um, insured has done to mitigate uh, further loss and damage uh, um, caused by maybe a potential hurricane or a windstorm activity. So now a lot of our galleries, a lot of our clients are uh, asked to uh, present a disaster plan. As I'm sure um, most institutions in Florida are required by their insurance companies to have this disaster plan. Um, so that's uh, a, a development out of uh, the series of hurricanes that we've had. So I, my advice to you is to is to lean on your your, your Florida Association museums and other organizations to to uh, develop these plans if you don't have one. Um, make sure that uh, you have. Close communications with your your supporting agencies within your state, and also with your local fire and police departments, so they know um, um, they know more about your collection. They know how it's stored, how it's exhibited. They know your facility. They know point people they can contact uh, to build a relationship. If you don't have one with them, this is critical. Um, I would also uh, suggest or recommend if you haven't done so already. I'm sure you many of you already had. Have um, is to have a good relationship with your fine art uh, warehouse facility, uh, with the transit companies that you use, uh, with um, mitigation companies that, uh, including like freeze dry facilities, um, um, etc. So, in case there is loss or, or disaster, you have a, a contract in place or a relationship in place that you can go to these companies for immediate uh, response and assistance. Um, and um, I guess that's it. So I want to thank you all for the opportunity. And if you have any questions, let me know. That was great. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think it was, it was super important to me, the thing that you had said about um, having multiple layers of documentation. We just did our, our little webinar on documentation. And that was something that all of us as, as registrars were like saying over and over again was essentially like, make sure you have documentation, make sure you have multiple levels of it. Um, because without those, like even just, you know, day-to-day -day registration operation procedures, you just never know what's going to happen. So it's nice to have multiple copies of your collection records kind of all over the place. Well, I'm going to go ahead and say if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. And I'm going to go ahead and ask if Jeff and John can both come on the mic and be available to answer questions. Um, I'm going to start off with a quick question to both of you. Um, I know that, John, in your presentation, you talked about, obviously, with collections coverage. Um, the thing that I always find a big sticking point is when people always ask me, what's the value of your collection, right? Because that's something as someone who works in the museum world, you often have to come up with. How do, do you guys have any recommendations on how you can come up with that? I mean, obviously, if you have an appraisal done, that's great. But with a lot of our smaller groups, um, they might not be able to afford an appraiser or have an appraiser that they can access. So is there another way to come up with that value that you might recommend? 
John, do you want to take this or do you want me to? Uh, you can, uh, most museums subscribe to some sort of, uh, art sale, uh, service and you can track values that way. But it's a moving target. It's, you know, it depends on if the market is moving constantly. So you don't, you can't ever get it, uh, precise from moment to moment. You, you can track generally what that particular kind of object that artist is bringing in and work from there. I think that's a, that's a, about your only and, and probably the best option for determining the value of your collection, but it's a moving target that can't can ever be nailed down super precisely. Yeah, I think that, uh, I'll interject, John. I, I think that John's right. I think it is a moving target, but in terms of trying to find out what kind of a policy limit one should, one should have for an institution, that's also a difficult task. And every institution has a, uh, it's different. There's, I worked for AM for a number of years, and there really aren't any standard fine art. Um, insurance uh, regulations or standards out there um, in, from an underwriting perspective, but what we generally ask um, our insurers to provide us is a top 10 highest value items in the collection, and then where are those top 10 located? Um, yeah. That's sort of like a baseline for for where we, we would like to see a limit. Uh, usually, um, if you can add up all, you know, all the, or or um, in your permanent collection gallery space within your institution, if you add up all your uh, the values of all the total objects that are in that particular room, um, that's also a good starting point uh, to to start and taking a, a look at what a limit of a policy should should be. Um, another thing to consider, another big thing to consider, are your long and short term loans because mm-hmm. uh, those will be the first. Um, in, in the case of a catastrophic event, you want to pay those those lenders off first, uh, because those are those are relationships that the cultural institutions and museums have developed over the over years for an institution or a lender to loan to that institution. So you want to make sure that those lenders are, are satisfied with the outcome of a claim settlement should something catastrophic happen. Um, so taking a look at your top 10, taking a look at your total values um, in any one area. It doesn't have to be the, the permanent gallery within your institution. It could be off-site storage. It could be storage within your institution. Um, as And also taking a look at your long and short-term loans, that sort of helps develop where your limits should be and should establish for you uh, a baseline of, of what your limits should be on your policy. Because the likelihood of a catastrophic event happening uh, in an institution is, is slim, um, so you um, may consider: well, if this gallery went, it's all in this total gallery on this wing. Um, that's usually in a, in a situation such as a fire; it's not going to attack the entire building; it would just attack a partial part of that building. Yeah, I know. It's it's hard when you're trying to come up with these values because I know I've worked at so many different places where th- there was one place I worked at that actually had had an appraisal done, which was great. But then when you, you know, obviously we had the collection items that were added on after the appraisal. And then you just, you know, those of us who work, especially any of our institutions, you just end up with like weird stuff that you're like, I don't know how much to value the 50 cent postcard that someone said, you know what I mean? Like you look at it and you're like, I guess it's 50 cents. So it's, I like the idea of the top 10. I think that's really smart because I think that, that would be areas of the building. Exactly. Areas of the building. I think are also really important as well. Yeah. Um, And as John, uh, as John said earlier, I think your building might often be the highest valued uh, piece in your collection. So a lot of, a lot of folks don't consider uh, the building itself, or the things that are attached on that building, that uh, that also should be considered that that make your institution unique and special. Yeah, exactly. And the loan thing is super interesting as well, because obviously, like you said, even in like disaster plans, um, if there's any damage to anything, those are really if you have loaned items in your on exhibit or in your collection, those are kind of top priority. Um, because they're not really yours. So, you know, I like the fact that there's a stress on that because you really have to take care of those items. Well, I, for sure. Um, I also liked also, Jeff, when you were talking about, I, I found it very interesting how you said insurance companies are now asking for disaster plans up in New York. Um, 
I, I would not. I don't know. Do they do that? Have you heard of that down here in uh, Florida, John? Yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah, I have a lot. Of, I have a lot of Florida. I mean, most of our most of my Florida clients and Florida museums, um, the insurance companies are requiring that they receive a copy of their emergency plan, um, or you know, what or emergency plan or hurricane disaster plan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so they, so they do they do ask for that, especially if the institution is near is on the coast or are within twenty five miles of, of the coast. Right, and that Absolutely. that that just makes complete sense to me because it shows me that like people have like thought it out a little bit and said, okay, you know, if we get hit with something, which we've had a lull here in Florida, um, obviously you know, Saint Augustine got hit kind of badly this past year, but um, mm -hmm. beyond that, you know, it's we've had kind of a I don't want to say a nice lull, but it's been quiet. You know what I mean? So I keep waiting, and we kind of yeah. had some scares. But we didn't really, you know, there was a, there was minor damage. Tallahassee also got hit a bit, the Gulf Coast, but um, it, it could have been a lot worse. So I think one of the things that Hurricanes, Francis, Gene, and Wilma kind of cheered thought for is that again, it's it's water uh, more often than fire that's the, that's the challenge or the the greatest risk, and and it can be water in the form of humidity. We you know we lost power here in South Florida some of us for two weeks. Well, the relative humidity and South Florida can do a lot of damage to your collection over a two-week period. So uh, we invested in a generator to back up the climate control system and run the entire building because that turned out to be our greatest risk. Um, and that, you know, so in a sense, we bought some insurance by buying a generator uh, that was large enough to run the entire building. And then, um, you know, then that, that biggest threat becomes uh, an odd issue. No, I agree. I agree. I, especially a lot of the insurance companies that I deal with uh, for my Florida clients, they they always ask if they have a backup generator um, in case there is a power outage where uh, the humidity, humidity can be controlled um, through that generator. So it's if you do have a generator, if you if you don't have a generator, and I would suggest uh, looking into that. Um, it would help you in your premium costs. Yeah, for sure. I know we have a couple floating around my house after the fun of 2005, yeah. so that's for sure. Well, taking a look at the chat box, I'm not seeing any questions, so um, I think we'll probably go ahead and wrap up today, but thank you again both just for the great presentation. That was a great overview, and I it was nice to kind of see what types of insurance coverage we should have, as well as um, just kind of how the, how the agent, how the kind of the industry has changed due to disasters and I, and I like that I like seeing how they're like okay we went through this so let's learn and grow from these experiences I think that's an important part of any industry thank you again to your speakers I really appreciate it um, and this webinar will hopefully be up on our YouTube channel and about by the end of the week hopefully so thank you again I hope everyone has a great day and we will see you soon